You've got questions, apparently a lot of them, and we've got answers, a lot of them, on this episode of Ask the Captain. Here we go at number one. Just in case 5847 says, how do you guys determine aircraft weight accurately enough to calculate parameters like fuel? Uh, how do you account for carry-ons, passenger weight, etc.? That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into the weight of an aircraft for takeoff and landing and all those things. Don't you wish there was like a great big scale out there and you could just kind of drive the airplane up to it and it would tell you to the pound how much your airplane weighed? Well, there isn't. So get over that. Uh, so they do it through a variety of different measures. Back in my Navy days, we kind of did it by hand. We had a slide rule. We had to calculate things on a piece of paper. It's much more scientific these days. For instance, fuel. Most jet fuel that most airliners take is somewhere in the vicinity of six and a half pounds per gallon. Uh, it varies a little bit by the type of fuel, but right in that ballpark. So they'll come up with the exact weight per gallon, how many gallons you put into the airplane. That's the fuel calculation. They do a general calculation for passengers. Women are slightly less than men and that that weight calculation goes up by the time of year in the winter time uh, they add about eight pounds per female and male to the weight because you carry more things with you, you carry heavier coats and so forth and you tend to put on a little weight in the winter okay just saying so that all gets factored in on top of all that they have a certain amount of weight for the bags they actually when the bags go and get checked in they actually do get weighed and then your carry-on bags they count how many carry-on bags go on i have been bumped off a flight before as a jump seater because after they did the final carry-on bag count they didn't have enough leftover space for me to get on the airplane that's not a comment about this it's just they have a certain calculation for every carry-on bag if we'd gotten rid of three or four carry-ons i probably could have gotten on but that's the way it works so they put all that in then there's a fudge factor on top of all of that uh, to make sure that you don't even get close. Most of my normal flights are well under any sort of uh, parameter that might be close to a weight restriction. I have lots of power to spare, but that's that's really a great question. Next is Mr. Hockey Thrill Junkie 1172. What do pilots do when they take off or land from an airport that usually has a lot of turbulence, such as Salt Lake City Airport? Well, that's one of those things that we brief ahead of time. It doesn't make any difference which airport it is, I always brief the takeoff weather, uh, whatever conditions we expect on takeoff. I will brief my flight attendants, for instance, if it's going to be real choppy on our climb out to just remain seated. Normally, as you know from my dings video, we ding the flight attendants at 10,000 feet, and that's when they can get up and start doing their duties. I will brief them ahead of time. Look, it might be a little choppy during the climb out, so uh, I'm not going to ding you. I'm going to call you when I think it's safe to get up, so just remain seated. And then if it's 17, 18, 20,000 feet before it kind of smooths out, that's when I'll give them a call on the phone and say, hey, you can get up and do your duties at this point. So all of those things are factors. A place like Salt Lake City, yeah, you need to be hyper vigilant about it because there are a lot of turbulence in, in uh, some airports more so than others. All right, great. Uh, Jonathan Springle, 8238. Have you ever done a Sarajevo approach uh, in your former life or even in your current airplane that you fly? Well, not in the current airplane that I fly. And I think what you're talking about here is like a spiraling down to the airport approach. Uh, those are many times done in war zones or near war zones. And uh, the, obviously, if, that, if it's, it's got to be like that in an airliner, we don't even go there. We don't even get close to that sort of thing. Uh, now, back in my military days, did we do some stuff? Yeah, we did. And I can't talk about it, but it, it was you know similar to this. There's all sorts of different operations that you do that, uh, you know, you want to stay out of harm's way and, and you don't want to get detected. That's probably the bigger thing as well. So uh, have I done it? Yes, in a former life, not at the airlines. Great, great question. All right. Uh, Sutton Cowgirl writes, uh, does the airline get cranky with the crew if you have to divert, even though that's usually out of our control uh, in the best interest of those on board. Um, yeah. And uh, you might actually be in the airline business, by the way you put that question, but we, uh, I have never gotten any pushback anytime I've had to divert. Now, all of my diverts up to this point have been really clear cut. It's like, okay, there was a sick passenger. Somebody had a heart attack. There was damage or something. You had to divert to a different airport. And so that's real clear before you even go there. And you kind of negotiate where you're going to divert with dispatchers back at headquarters before you even go there. Now, have there, have I heard about pilots? over the years that were kind of like divert happy 
Uh, it's very odd and very unusual, but there are some guys that, boy, for whatever reason, they love to divert. And uh, have they gotten a phone call and had to explain? Yeah, it's like any other job. You have to be accountable for the decisions that you make. And some of those decisions cost the company money, and some of them really inconvenience the passengers. If they're necessary, safety always triumphs over everything. But if they weren't so necessary and it was just kind of a you thing, then you'd expect a phone call and have to answer for that. I've never, I've never had one of those phone calls, but yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question actually. All right. Corn Delta writes, uh, why do some people actively refuse to wear their seatbelts on planes? Is it some kind of misunderstanding and misunderstood idea of freedom? I think it is. I think some people, they just don't like any sort of restraint and they just kind of, kind of rebel against that. It's most unwise because I can't always predict bumpy air and you want to stay in that seat. Uh, next time you get on and you're thinking, I'm going to undo my seatbelt, just look up ahead of, above you. Right above you is, is what you're going to hit. And it's only about this far above. So if there's any sort of a updraft or downdraft or any sort of hiccup with the airplane and you come flying out of that seat, you're going to hit your head real hard. Just keep the seatbelt on. It's, it's easy enough to do. Right. Great question. All right. Uh, California Glow 9666. Do people... Uh, who do not wear their seatbelts try to sue the airlines in these cases. I don't know. I'm not an attorney. I don't know what happens after somebody gets hurt that wasn't wearing a seatbelt. My guess is you wouldn't have a leg to stand on, no pun intended. But if you went and the seatbelt sign was on and you didn't have your seatbelt fastened, that's kind of an obligation you have to do that. The flight attendants will come and check to see that you have it fastened. But I've seen people, as soon as the flight attendants come down and check, as soon as they pass, they do like that and they open up their seatbelt again. I'm like, I, why would you do that? It's only going to hurt you. And so would somebody sue for that? I'm, You know, everybody's tried virtually everything over the years. I can't imagine that that's not been tried, but I don't think you'd have uh, much uh, success with that. But yeah, you know, give it a try. All right, Andrew Price, 1189. As a pilot steering on the ground, is it difficult to judge how wide any given aircraft is? And is the pilot's ultimate responsibility to make sure you have space to get through any given space? Yes, this is an excellent question. So my aircraft is like a ship at sea. And there are certain levels of what you call maritime law that apply. So this is a much bigger question than you asked. But once I get underway and I'm moving, if I strike anything on the ground, including another aircraft or a truck or a sign or anything that's not moving, I am always at fault. It's a ship at sea strikes a ship at rest. The ship at sea is always at fault. So I've got to make doubly sure that I don't run into anything. But from the cockpit, I can't see the ends of my wings. I just have an idea of where they are. Now, I know the number. I, mean, I know how wide the airplane is, but I can't calculate that by looking out uh, just out the window because I can't see exactly where the end of the wing is. So I always give it a little extra space. You kind of get a feel for it over the years, especially when you're taxiing an airplane around a, a corner and you you the nose gear of the airplane, that nose wheel is actually behind me where I'm sitting in the cockpit. So I've got to judge where that nose wheel is. I want to bring the nose wheel out and around so I don't keep it always on the, the center line. I bring it out and around a little wide so that when I do make my turn, the main mounts and that big rear end of the airplane pivots out as well. And I stay on the center line of the taxiway. There's a lot of judgment that goes into taxiing and a lot of practice that does. But for the most part, it's done very successfully. But that's that's a very insightful question. Weisenberg, 5570. Several years ago, I heard about new technology that could potentially avoid more of these turbulence issues. Are we there with this new technology? Yes, we are. The future is today. Now, is it getting better all the time? Yes. I'm eager for them to redo the entire air traffic control system. I think in terms of turbulence, we're going to get even better information out of them. That's just one part of the equation. I've got an iPad now that's on Wi-Fi constantly. I get constant updates on the weather. I've got a, an app that's called SkyPath. And I can watch every other airplane uh, in the sky and I can see behind them what their turbulence were. So I, it, they turn white, yellow, or kind of red if it's severe turbulence or real moderate turbulence. So I can look and I can go, hey, look, all these aircraft up in front of us, they're all going through moderate to uh, worse turbulence. And so we'll reroute. We'll, we'll try to get away from that path so we don't go through those turbulence. And I get a, an alert that says uh, moderate turbulence five minutes ahead. That's really almost pilot proof right there. So I can warn everybody in the back, take a seat, strap your seatbelt in. 
because uh, we're going to get a bumpy ride. All right. So the technology has really, really advanced uh, just over probably the last three or four years. Really, really good. So yesterday, it's now today. It's here. All right. Good question. All right. I've got uh, Sebastian uh, Rojas 6290. Can any commercial pilot safely fly any commercial airplane? Well, the, the bigger picture answer on that is yes. When I got hired at my airline, I didn't get hired to fly a specific airplane in that airplane for the rest of my career. They hired me in general as a competent pilot and said they would know that over the years I would change from airplane. Now, from airplane to airplane, I have to go through training. I have to go through simulator training. I have to go through multiple check rides. Then I have to be followed by a check airman or a check pilot for the first 25 hours in the actual physical airplane until I am signed off to be you know, in charge or be a co-pilot or be a captain on that airplane. But could I fly any airplane in our fleet? Yes, I could. If it was an emergency and both pilots were incapacitated and it was an airplane that I wasn't qualified on, um, could I land it safely? Yeah, pretty much so. I, I'm, I've got enough experience in large commercial air transport category aircraft that I could land that airplane safely. If you got a lot of flight simulator time, probably not. It's not the same. Just, just saying. All right. All right. So let's see. I got Lynn Curdy, a bunch of letters and numbers. All right. Is there a speed limit per plane? Uh, a while back, a flight was delayed while a minor repair was made. When we took off, the pilot announced he was going to go as fast as he legally could. And the answer is yes, there are many uh, speed limits for airplanes around the world below 10,000 feet. The max speed limit is 250 knots. You can go slower than that, but you can't go faster than that. The only exception to the 250 knot rule below 10,000 feet is if air traffic control says to you free speed then you can go faster than that. They don't normally do that. Everybody slows down to 250. Why? Because below 10,000 feet, you're getting spaced into an airport and they're going to call your speed most major airports and slow you down so you don't get too close behind another aircraft. So that's one. Now above 10,000 feet, it's based on the limit of your airplane. So let's say, for instance, I'm going to Europe and I had a delay on the gate and we're going to be a little bit late. And I say to everybody, hey, folks, we'll do what we can to make up the speed or make up the time to go there. And let's say I was um, I was uh, dispatched to fly over to Europe at 0.82 Mach. That's a, a Mach speed that's a percentage of the speed of sound. So 0.82 Mach. Now, my airplane might be able to fly at 0.87 mock. Uh, could I bump it up a little bit? Sure. So sometimes I'll say to the co-pilot, do we have enough gas? Does it look good? Let's double check each thing. Yep. You want to go over at 8.4? Yep. I want to go over at 8.4. We agree on that and we bump it up to 0.84. So on a long flight, that's maybe eight or nine hours going from 0.82 to 0.84, you might make up 15 minutes at the best. Uh, your headwinds and your tailwinds are going to be the biggest component. But I also have to make sure before I bump up the speed like that, that I've got a smooth enough ride. Because if it gets really bumpy, the faster I'm going, the rougher the ride gets. So I want to make sure I've got smooth air the whole way. So sometimes I'll, I'll just say, you know what, we got to stay at A2 because they're forecasting turbulence up ahead and I can't bump it up. It's going to make the turbulence even worse. So it's a trade-off between the smoothness of the ride, the comfort of the passengers, and getting there on time or making up a little bit of time. Those are all the factors that go into it. Most pilots are going to tell you, you know what, we'll do what we can to make up the time. And they're not wrong. They're just limited in some things. But great question. All right. Uh, let's see. I got Scrambler 390, right? So what percentage of stopping is done by the reversers and what percentage by brakes? Also, if for some reason the reversers failed, could the brakes themselves stop the aircraft upon landing? So let's take those in reverse order. Yes is the answer to that. I have flown many airplanes where one or both of the reversers were uh, placarded in op. They weren't working. So I didn't have any reverse at all. Yes, you can land the airplane just fine. You have to go into the iPad and figure out your landing distance without any reversers working. It usually adds a little bit of distance, but it's not a whole lot. Why? Because the reversers aren't that big a part of your stopping on the runway. It's a small percentage of the overall effect. Mostly the spoilers coming up on the wings and the brakes are the things that are going to get you to come to a stop. Um, when you're faster, when you first touch down and you go into reverse, that's where you get the most effectiveness out of the reversers. As you slow down, you get less and less and less. I don't know exactly what the percentage is. I'm going to say something like maybe 15 
to 20% of your total braking initially is related to the reversers. The, the vast majority is related to the brakes and the spoilers and just getting that nose of the airplane down. So now you know, that's an excellent question. All right, uh, Sharona 248, are small airplanes as safe as big airplanes? Every airplane that flies has to pass annual inspections. They have to have, a, uh, the FAA has certain requirements for them. Um, now, are you talking about small airplanes at a airline or small airplanes like civilian airplanes. All of them, civilian or commercial, have the same requirements in terms of annual inspections. The airlines get many more than that. The airlines have constant maintenance done to them. And so uh, if it's a small jet at an airline or a large one, exactly the same. They're all exactly as safe. Could you make the argument that a smaller jet is more safe than a larger one because it has less, fewer systems on it? I guess. Uh, but I don't. I, I think it's just a semantical argument. Um, every, these airplanes are safe. They're they're scrutinized. The maintenance is absolutely spectacular on these airplanes. And I'm telling you that as a 40 year veteran of flying uh, those airplanes, I it's top shelf. Really, really good. Okay. Final question. Uh, Alicia Poza 9947. You have mentioned many times about the training you go through with the airlines. Are the other major airlines the same with the rigorous training as well? Absolutely. It's all mandated by the FAA. Every airline has a rigorous, rigorous training program for their pilots. They have the highest standards, whether it's American, Delta, United, uh, you know, uh, West Jet, uh, you know, Jet Blue doesn't make any difference. They all have very, very high standards, and the FAA is the one who monitors all of that. So I will have when I go for a check ride in the simulator, I many times will have either a member of the FAA watching, observing, or an FAA designee at my company. They go through a whole extra battery of tests and qualifications to be an FAA designee, and they are holding the standard. They, those are the standard bearers for the quality of training at all of the airlines. And they do a terrific job. They hold a really, really high standard. I'm here to tell you, um, I'm, you know, one good thing about my airline career coming to an end is I have no more of those rigorous uh, check rides in the, the, um, in the simulator. I'm going to kind of miss those days as well, though. It's kind of a mixed bag. Well, great questions this time around. You you made the top list, the top shelf of Ask the Captain. Keep those questions coming because your questions might make it on the next episode of Ask the Captain.